Okay, so this is joint work with some people from Morgan State University. Uh, Iftigar Ahmed's a, a grad student there. Alex and Carlos are profs. And uh, there's been some interest uh, in a number of areas of uh, trying various techniques in RCU. Apparently in uh, academic verification and validation, if you really want to be known as a you know, really tough, hard person, you apply your tools to Lance Kernel RCU, and if you can get something to happen, then, you know. Which I'm encouraging because it's a lot easier when they find the bugs than me having to, you know, go off and talk to people who see them in the real life than give stuff to me, right? So, why, why is this a problem? Well, there's more than a billion this is the Linux kernel running today. And I first realized this several years ago. And of course, the real first reaction is, yay, we've won! You know, great! Yeah, and then it's kind of like, uh, let's see, uh, suppose I've got a million year race condition in RCU somewhere, and if there's a billion of them running there, it's happening three times a day across the installed base. And, and there's a lot of things I could do, right? I mean, how many, pe how many people have uh, Android smartphones? Raise your hands. Yeah, okay. How many people expect those things to still be running a million years from now? Oh, we got one optimist, all right, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, so I could say, well, you know, if I got a million erase condition, hardware errors will totally cover it up. Nobody will notice because maybe some transistor flipped or a cosmic ray hit or what. I don't know. On the other hand, um, as I think I've said in this venue before, it's also the case that in certain jurisdictions in Europe, and perhaps this one as well, and perhaps the one I came from, if you have some mechanism, uh, perhaps something controls some vehicle, and you put it through an, a, a specified acceptance test. Usually this means a few years, like maybe three or five. And it passes that acceptance test. You get safety critical certification, even if there's a Linux kernel inside of it. Now, you don't get the highest level of safety uh, critical that way, but you can get safety critical enough to where your stuff can be in a train that people ride, or in an airplane, or whatever. So um, I'm, at, at that point, it's kind of like, well, uh, yeah, I don't want to hide behind the hardware. Uh, I'd really feel bad if my software killed somebody. So I kind of think I need to up the validation game. And part of this might be mutation testing, which I'm talking about now. I've talked about other approaches at other times, and there's various other things happening as well. But today, mutation testing. And the idea here is that you automatically change the code. And then you run your test suite on it, and you see if it catches it. And they have this weird, how many people have ever heard of the language prologue? How many people have actually written prologue code? All right, well, there's a prologue script out there, and it takes a C file as input. And as it reads line by line, it says, oh, here's a line, let's try deleting it. We'll output a file with that line commented out. Um, has it got some constants? Yeah, well, let's change those constants. It'll try several different changes based on what they've done in the past. Has it got relational operators? Let's change the relational operators. Is it a while or an if? Let's negate the expression. Does it do a plus equals? Well, why not a percent equals instead? <laughs> it really did that on one of the lines of code. I think my test suite did catch that one, but I'd, uh, I'd have to go back and look. Um, and uh, anyway, so you end up with a separate for a source file for each of these mutations, and that means you end up with thousands of files for RCU. And uh, then what you do is you run them through RCU torture. Now this means, of course, that you have a uh, long test time because you're running 16 different scenarios of RCU torture on each of these stupid things. And also, uh, yours truly gets to manually analyze the ones that don't fail. Uh, the point is, of course, if you modify the test code, especially if you replace plus equals by percent equals, uh, the test should really have caught that. And if it doesn't, maybe you need to fix the test. So that's the whole point here. Uh, the next slide just shows some examples of some, of some uh, constant replacement, just because that one. Uh... So the first one, this is one it really did. This is in a structure declaration. We have the, the GCC style initialization there. And instead of uh, setting this uh, pointer to point to the beginning of the array, it decided to set point it to the first element instead, um, which would cause some confusion somewhat later. Uh, sometimes, though, they have no effect. There was a while one. Well, it said, why not a while two? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fortunately, GCC says, well, okay, whatever, and generates exactly the same binary in both cases, so part of the stage of this, this says stages of go through, we'll 
look at these in more detail later slide. Uh, but what it does is, the first thing it does is compiles the thing. If it compiles the same as the original, it says, eh, whatever, forget this one. Uh, it doesn't bother me with it, thankfully. Uh, other ones uh, have no effect, but in more complicated ways. So if you have a, something that's more or less a Boolean function, except we haven't made it bool yet and true and false, it'll change it to return one to a return two. And GCC, okay, return two, whatever, return two. And so it'll be different than the original, and that means I have to look at it. Although in this case, it'd be easy for me to see, yeah, whatever, forget this one. Um, and some of them have no effect, but in more complicated ways. So there's this uh, grace period number. The kind of it's, uh, RCU kind of goes through cycles with grace periods over time. And uh, uh, there's a grace period number that tracks them, and normally it starts off at negative 300, but you could start it off at, in this case, negative um, 1, and it's not going to notice. Uh, I believe in one case it actually made a change that caused the grace period counter to count backwards, and that actually worked. And that one took me a little while longer to figure out, does that really work? Oh, yeah, it does. Okay, whatever. Uh, and, then, and so there can be some significant time looking at the ones that escape. So what's the advantage and disadvantage of this approach? Well, one thing is that no specification is required. And for RCUs, that's a good thing because we don't have a specification. Um, and if we did, it'd probably be as big as RCU itself and the Linux kernel and probably have at least as many bugs. Um, of course, if you have a verification, the guy will say, if you don't have a specification, I can't help you. So another way to look at it is that we do have a specification. It's just that it's implicit. It's implicit in RCU torture, because RCU torture makes it do certain things and complains if something bad happens. It's implicit in the compiler, because the compiler will scream at you if you change the code in certain ways. And it's also implicit in the assertions, the warn-ons, the bug-ons, and other things like that in the RCU torture code itself. So by taking this approach, instead of having to manually generate by hand a complex specification that probably is wrong, Instead, we use well, another, an implicit specification already in the code, which is probably also wrong, but we can fix those bugs as we come across them. Uh, another problem, a disadvantage, is that some of these mutants introduce low probability race conditions. You know, something like, yeah, uh, eventually that's going to get you in trouble because you just removed the locking guarding this variable. But it's a very unusual error case. You're probably going to hit it very often, and uh, you may have to run for a long time to catch that one. That might be one of those million-year bugs. And of course, in those cases, we have extreme run times. Um, although we haven't got to that point yet, currently our run times are two minutes. And of course, the ones that escape require significant manual analysis, and that would be me. So of course, I'm, if we're doing this, I'm kind of motivated to make RCU torture and the assertions and so on catch as many errors as they can, so I have less stuff I have to look at. So how bad is it? The idea here, the, the, the strategy you have to use is to discard the uninteresting mutants, the ones that don't really change anything or for whatever reason aren't indic indicative of a test bug, as quickly as you can. And the reason is just tiny RCU. We've actually gone through the full process with that one. We're working on tree RCU right now. We had over 3,000 mutants for tiny RCU. Okay? And that means you've got to compile the kernel 3,394 3, times. Fortunately, Iftikhar was doing that, not me. And this did narrow the search field somewhat. Uh, 378 failed to recompile, so yay, GCC won for us there. 321 generated the same binary as the original, so this is one of these funny mutants that didn't really mutate it by the time you got into compiling it. And 746 uh, caused a change in the binary, but it was the same as some other mutant. So you only have to test them once in that case, so we get rid of those as well. And uh, so we got rid of 31% of the mutants just by going through those kind of filtering steps. And of those, 2180 failed running RCU torture on a two CPU x86 running for two minutes per round. Um, but you get to multiply that by 16 because there are 16 test cases. So it's a long run. So that meant 159 required me to look at them, um, which is not as bad as it could be, given we're starting at 3,000, but it uh, still is a fair amount of uh, work. Uh, now, one of the things that come out of this, of course, is I have some suggestions for them on ways of making my job easier, and hopefully they'll do that later on. And believe it or not, just going through tiny RCU 
This resulted in three patches. I didn't expect any, my usual overconfident self. The first patch, uh, uh, we went through some stuff and there were some mutations in the SRCU cleanup path and they didn't fail. It's kind of like, you know, you did what? And it still didn't fail? And the reason, of course, was that that was, wasn't being tested. RCU torture wasn't even going through that code. So uh, one patch changed RCU torture to actually exercise the SRCU cleanup path. Um, I ran that and nothing really happened. Uh, the next one, uh, there were some changes to the code that again is like, how could this possibly not blow up? And the reason was is that RCU Tiny wasn't testing the BH variant. It was only testing the, the SCED variant or the normal variant. So that was fairly easy, make it do that. And uh, that resulted in, a, in an explosion in normal testing, just my normal testing. So this test hole was actually hiding a real bug and I'm thinking that maybe not many people use TinyRCU because I'm not sure how you would run it very long without this thing blow up in your face. But uh, I was able to fix this bug if you, I'm trying to remember how it worked. If you ended up in a race such that you ended up getting to where you were to process callbacks, but there weren't any callbacks to process, it would die a horrible death. Now maybe just that that doesn't happen very often, um, or, and maybe it's infrequent enough they think it's their hardware instead, I don't know. But we fixed that, and that's, uh, I think, a pretty valuable result of this exercise. It was worth the time I put into it to find that and to improve my test so if I do something stupid like that again, I'll detect it more quickly. So the next step is trying on tree RCU. We're in the, we're in the middle of doing that. We've done one round of runs. Um, and uh, I've come up so far with seven possible improvements to RCU torture, which I have not yet done. I just got through scanning through the leftovers uh, uh, about four weeks ago. One of them is to ensure that callback lists are non-empty non when CPUs go offline. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised that the current test doesn't catch this, um, but uh, in any case, we really need that piece of the code to be tested, and so I need to, I need to look at that and see what's going on. And I'm not going to go through the other ones in detail, but uh, you, can, you can look at them. Uh, I don't have a stats and overview about how many of the different scenarios were caught by the different uh, things that they were doing for you yet. Hopefully we'll get that in a little while. Um, but anyway, the, uh, so uh, what's the next thing? Uh, one of them, I, I need to actually do some of those RCU torture improvements. Some of them, uh, for example, there were some that would only happen if you actually wrapped a counter. By wrapping a counter, I mean actually having the counter give a value and going all the way around and coming back to where you started, which on a 64-bit system, you can say, sorry, we don't build 500-year computers yet. Um, it'd have to be longer than that. Grace periods don't go at a, at a nanosecond each, but still. 30-bit uh, systems, you could imagine that happening with a long-running system, although you'd have to have some poor task stuck for long enough to get soft lockup warnings for a really long time. But maybe you're running an embedded system where you have soft lockup disabled. I don't know. Um, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that. I mean, I could just have, I could crank the counters down to eight bits for testing purposes, although that would change a lot of other things. So I may leave that one out and, and talk to the formal verification guys about helping me out on that end instead of trying to uh, test it for real. Uh, so anyway, they need to do heavier, heavier testing. I was surprised at how effective a two minute test on a two CPU system was at finding these mutants, but still it needs to be better. Um, so we're getting access to some bigger machines and some out of order machines, and weak, more weakly, um, weak memory model machines. Uh, they're doing it one at a time because that's all they had, two CPUs. And uh, well, uh, running 16 RCUs and torture scenarios a few thousand times uh, sequentially is not a way to get it done quickly. Uh, I hope that they're able to improve automated testing of inner mutants because otherwise it uh, takes a lot of my time and uh, of course, one of the things they're very interested in is having their prologue script upgraded so it introduces more nastier and more interesting terms of mutations. For example, right now, it mutates one line at a time. Just mutates one line, dumps the, dumps the thing out. Um, maybe they'd like to do something where they do coordinated ones. For example, um, if you just remove a lock acquisition, LockDap is going to catch it pretty much guaranteed. You're going to release a lock that wasn't held or, or keep a lock that wasn't. If you, could, if you could make it smart enough to actually remove all of the lock acquisitions and releases for that piece of the code, you could test to see, you could get an idea of how good your test suite was at catching that kind of bug. So anyway, that is mutation testing and what we've done with it so far and what we might do with it. 
Questions, thoughts, bananas? Yeah. Project Stoke. I uh, can't say I know of that one right offhand. Did this statistic help them on the Thrum assembly? Uh, that, okay. Is this, is this like the hyper optimizers of the 80s where they were um, doing AI? This is the Stanford Project. Stanford Project. Okay, I have not come across this one. Uh, anyway, it's pretty much just randomly generate assembly for the routine and make sure the reasons come out the same again. Um, and the way you're talking about you know, the software, I think some a lot of the engines that they have behind Stoke sound is possibly a better. One of, the, one of the things the Google guys have started doing, um, they've taken, there's a thing called American Fuzzy Lop, or AFL, okay? Uh, how many people know what that is? Okay, that's enough that don't that I'll go through it. So what this thing does, right now it's set up for sequential programs where you have some input and some output, although clearly you could make a front end that turned input into a schedule of events that RC could deal with and make it be parallel if you wanted. And what happens is that it also compiles the code with coverage. And then it kind of does an AI gaming thing where it tries to increase the coverage. Okay. Um, there was a, I saw a demo of one a few months ago. Remember, remember the Heartbleed bug that was this massive thing to find? AFL will find that in less than a minute on a laptop. Okay. Just by taking the input and mooshing around and, and bam, it hits it. So... Um, the Google guys have taken that and adapted it for the Linux kernel. And it's kind of like fuzz testing, but with the goal of increasing coverage. And so something like that, possibly you know, pulling RCU out and, and doing something like that sounds like it sounds similar to what you're suggesting, uh, would be quite interesting. Now, um, uh, I suppose if you had a, a spec for RCU and tried to generate optimized assembly for it, that would be interesting, but that would be uh, an interesting thing. Maybe we do it for little pieces of RCU that prove to be <laughs> Performance critical. Okay, so we had somebody over here and then in back. Yeah. An AFL tool. Oh, cool! You should go see it. It's uh, it's an impressive thing. Who's giving that? Okay. Uh, this well, KCC at Google was the guy who gave it last time. Okay. Yeah. Can the script handle things apart from C? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but uh, send me an email and I'll find out. Yeah? Has he uh, maintained and uh, improved the code base over time? How useful would the mutation testing be for regression testing? That, uh, so the question was, uh, how useful is this for regression testing? Um, and it's a big time investment. Um, so. It took a few months to do it. And so since releases of the Linux kernel are more closely spaced in a few months, that kind of fails the definition of a regression test. Um, on the other hand, what it's doing is not testing the code as much as it's testing the test. Um, and in that sense, it's valuable potentially do every so often, although I'm not sure. Um, uh, it's easy to say I should do it every few years. So I'm actually doing it. Uh, well, <laughs> you can ask me a few years whether I really do, right? Yeah. In some sense, this is kind of like where we have um, like fuzz testing or property based testing that will uh, generate new inputs for us. This is the stuff that's fuzzing the code itself rather than the input. Yeah, the point is that this is fuzzing the code rather than the input, right. but it's similar to fuzz testing. Yep. So, so these um, some techniques that we've used in property based testing and, and fuzz testing are trying to generate minimal cases to try to take the work off the uh, after the fact very much. What kind of work have you guys explored in the ways that kind of take that? Okay, so uh, what plans do I have to minimize my work? Lots of them. I like minimizing my work. But with respect to what exactly? To with respect to running uh, these tests or with respect to my normal RCU torture regression testing? Um, the, not the actual running the test itself, but um, trying to come to like, investigating why you didn't catch failure. Oh, okay. Um, the, the, uh, what, what I've been doing for the most part is kind of delegating that to the academics. Because they, 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 I don't, my compiler skills are kind of weak, okay, and, and a lot of what you would do is, for a lot of these, is say, all right, this, does this change actually propagate through and do something? 
Um, and you can make a you can in theory make a compiler do something like that, or if you have it, that would be a, your my first thought would be you should take a compiler approach to that perhaps a totally wrong thought but that would be my thought anyway, um, and so I'm and so hopefully they can make that happen. The other thing we've done is actually run formal verification tools, uh, the C bounded model checker for example, and do and do fuzz based testing and hand the hand the fuzzed programs to it and see if it finds them which. Um, it did some, and uh, they, uh, they did a paper on that as well. But uh, yeah, if, um, if you were to say everybody in, the, uh, everybody in the Linux kernel is going to do mutant testing, you would kind of want some automation of that, wouldn't you, just in case you didn't want to be lynched or something. <laughs> yes, Peter. The, so the, the uh, point Peter's making is that my initial setup for this was race conditions, and how is this going to find race conditions? Um, what, uh, what it can do, I mean, it, it isn't really specialized in any particular kind of bug. It's just insulting my test suite and causing me to make the test suite more vicious in some ways, which might or might not catch race conditions. In this particular case, did it catch a race condition? I mean, I found, I found one bug. And I'd have to look to tell you whether it was a race condition or not. It was a, a stupid enough bug that I, I'm not sure I would, uh, I, I'm not sure I would uh, put it that way. But the fact that it didn't catch it, um, or the fact that it hasn't occurred in the field, seems like there's some race to, uh, case to it. Otherwise, why wouldn't it be deterministic and be falling all over all the place? So um, you're right. The test technique isn't specifically aimed at race conditions, but I. Can't see why it wouldn't find them, given that the test does do stress testing, and therefore race conditions can trigger. Yes. Okay, so you can use this to find use the mutant testing to find things that go bad. Yep. Have you found any any cases where it pointed out something that you really should do? Like, hey, this would be an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> can you use my mutation testing to improve a code base by having the mutants suggest better ways of doing things? Darwin would. <laughs> it's like a useless lock. So um, I, did, I did find some uh, surprising equivalences. For example, running the grace period counter backwards, which isn't something I would have thought of doing, actually worked. Um, and it, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that really counts as an improvement. Let's see, what other what things did it do? <laughs> you can do performance testing on the, on the thing after, after mutating it. Um, there were some that uh, would improve the performance by chopping out large chunks of code, which, uh, but I'm not sure that I'd want to put up with the loss of, uh, of function in that case. Uh, in, in the cases I'm aware of, it didn't really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, I suppose if you ask my family, they have one answer for you. <laughs> yes? Yeah, it, it, it does a change on one line, and it only does very specific changes. Delete the line, change a constant, change an operator, um, negate a condition. And that's, again, that's one of the things that they're looking at, um, adding additional classes of mutants. Um, to, to, yeah, we, the main one that we've used as an example is removing a lock, as in getting rid of the lock and the unlocks. Um, any suggestions? Well, I was going to say moving a word or four out of the lock really would be very Okay, in other words, swapping lines. Yeah, if, if, this is, if this is a lock, try swapping it with some number of the following lines. Yeah, that could be cool. That actually might be easy to do, even. Yeah, I mean, you can Yeah, or as, as many source lines as you can until, until something until a branch problem would show up. Yeah. I suppose you could push the lock down both sides of an if statement or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, then that would probably be easier than trying to figure out where the heck all the unlocks are. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, thank you. We have one in the back, yeah. Have I considered running RCU torture on RCU torture? Um, 
It's not really set up to be recursive in that way. RC torture expects a certain API. It's inside the kernel. And so it expects to be an RC read lock and RC read unlock and whatever, and it doesn't supply those interfaces out the other end, so it wouldn't. We have talked about it, and it would certainly be easy to do. Um, uh, we haven't, uh, we, we've got enough backlog and the other things, we haven't tried that yet, but um, let's see, what would you prove if you changed RCU torture and it failed? Um, I suppose you'd have to look at both ways, because if it failed, you might have made the test better. If it didn't fail, you might have made the test worse, but you might have improved, you, you, but you might have improved, you know. That's a, um, so my question to you is, what, what would that mean? How would you use the results? I don't need to answer right now, but uh, uh, something to think about. Are we towards, is, is we do one more, or are we, are we, we done we here? We have more questions, if there's more questions. Okay. So more questions? I was, I was, uh, how practical do you think it would be to apply to other code bases, and at what size is it just, this is too much work? Um, I think it depends on how many people you have that are intimate with the code, and how willing they are to go do this stuff because that, it, it is a little bit of an investment. You know, taking 159 random changes to your code and saying, all right, why did my, I mean, that's not a huge amount of time. It's, you know, a few days. But um, uh, you, have to, you have to have somebody willing to do that or some number of people willing to do that. And so the more people are familiar with the code and can do that, the greater your chance of being able to pull it off. Obviously, the smaller the code base, <laughs> the easier it is. The code base, if you try to do this on the entire Linux kernel, um, you'd have, one heaping pile of uh, test cases, and you'd also have to run it through a whole bunch of different tests because there's so many different things that test the Linux kernel. Yeah. How many people are doing RCU torture development? Um, so I could. Uh, I mean, one way to, I, I'm, I'm a little confused by the question. One way I could answer the question would be I could, I could do git log um, on the rctorture.c and give you a list of the names. Um, I could say that most of them, are, mostly it's me. Um, you're talking about rctorture itself as opposed to the mutants. Um, most, of the, most of the patches to RCU and RCU torture are me. Maybe, oh, 60 or 70 percent, maybe 80 percent sometimes. I do get a fair number of contributions of one sort or another from people, but mostly it's me. You're looking at the, you're looking at the Linux kernel RCU torture, uh, RCU development team for the most part. Or, you know, more than half of it anyway. That's something that, uh, uh, increasing the bus number of a Linux kernel RCU is something that's important to and one of the reasons why I do the documentation things that I do. It's also one reason why I do this, because the less troublesome it is, the more time one has to react if I get run over by a bus, right? Paul? You said you didn't write 3,900 Something like that, 3,300. Because you ran it for a while and you stopped over there. It, it just has heuristics that it runs, so it picks a line of code and looks at the line of code, and it says, all right, what can I do to this thing, right? Um, so, Related to the total number of lines and also the structure of the code. For example, it won't delete an if because it knows that, you know, if it have an if with a curly brace, it deletes that. It'll, it knows it won't work. Um, and it, if it's replacing a constant, I'm not, I haven't quite figured out what its game is, but it picks certain constants to replace them with different ones at different times. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's basically a heuristic. It's been, it's was run and they sort of tuned it for some code base to try to cause the most trouble that they could with the least number of mutants. So if you do that, No free lunch, yes. The more mutations you have, the more types of mutations, the more testing you get to do. Now, one, one thing you can do is to randomly select. So generate a huge pile of mutants and run one out of 10 or something like that. Or say, I'm going to run 1,000, generate whatever's there, pick, randomly pick 1,000 and run them. Whether well, that's a good strategy or not, that's an interesting question, but it is a strategy. That's true. You could. More questions? Going once? Going twice? Lunch! <laughs> <laughs>